So having looked at cardiac dynamics, we're familiar with some terms like cardiac output, stroke volume and heart rate. And now we're going to look at, well, how do we sustain, what mechanisms are in place to sustain cardiac output to enable us to consistently eject a lot of blood around our body when we're exercising? Um, and how does that affect us in terms of our performance? So the specification actually asks you to be able to explain how venous return is maintained so and also how venous return can affect performance, the quality of our performance in a good or a less effective way. So in order to maintain cardiac output, in order to keep our heart ejecting blood and, and sending out oxygenated blood around the body for our muscles to use, we need to have a very good ability at returning venous blood or deoxygenated blood to the heart. So in order to pump it out, we've got to get it coming back into the heart. Um, and these, again, relate to our cardiac dynamic factors. Now, heart rate we will look at in a separate video. We'll look at regulating heart rates and how we control that and how it changes. Um, and in this video, we're focusing a bit more on um, stroke volume uh, in that relation of cardiac output. So stroke volume is, a f is um, affected by the strength of contraction. We know already it's affected by how much your ventricles fill, EDV, and also by this thing called venous return. So specifically, in order to maintain blood being ejected from the heart, we're going to look at venous return, and we're going to look at another thing called Starling's Law of the Heart, which links to how powerfully the heart contracts. These are the five things, um, mechanisms in which we can return blood to the help. These things help us get blood often up against gravity in our veins back to the heart so that our heart can eject them and we can maintain stroke volume and therefore cardiac output. If these things aren't working properly or sufficiently, we don't get enough blood back to the heart, we don't get enough blood ejected from our heart and things like our brain and sometimes our muscles won't work properly and we sometimes feel dizzy or a bit woozy. So it's really essential that these mechanisms are in place and are working well for us. So the, probably the most important one you'll need to be able to explain, you'll need to be able to just explain what they all are, but this is, this is the most effective one perhaps, is the skeletal muscle pump. And basically it involves our skeletal muscles, so it could be the big muscles in your legs, um, your gastronomius, your psoas, any of those big muscles you should be able to name, and veins. Now veins are the bigger, bigger vessels which help us return blood to the heart. And they're often situated near or between some muscles. Now, how does this help us? So when these muscles are relaxed, we have the blood in our veins. Now, again, you should, you should know that veins, off, the bigger veins, have valves in them. And what they do is they stop, uh, they create a one-way flow and they prevent, as these arrows show, they prevent the blood flowing downwards and backflow. So with the valve shut, the blood can't go anywhere. Now what you see here is the, the muscles contracting. And when the muscles contract, you'll see very clearly that they massage or they squeeze the vein. And the pressure of that squeeze forces the blood upwards against gravity through the valves um, until the muscles relax. When the muscles relax, the blood wants to come back down, but it can't because the valves snap shut. So if you have regular contraction, so this regular contraction and relaxation, you'll have basically a massaging, massaging action that constantly is pumping blood upwards to, against gravity and eventually returning it back to the heart. So that is the skeletal muscle pump. I will ask you to draw it so you need to be familiar with this one. <coughs> Secondly, um, the respiratory pump is another mechanism in place. Works very much in the same principle, except for muscles contracting, we've got pressure squeezing the veins. So when you breathe, there's a change in pressure in your thoracic cavity, and that, that change in pressure, the high pressure squeezes the vein, the lower pressure obviously lets the vein relax and so again with your breathing movements you create a massaging effect on the veins in the thoracic area again helping return blood to the heart. The third factor, the third mechanism are valves. Now I said already the big veins have valves in them 
and you can see several versions here so the blood goes through and then because these are called pocket valves when the blood tries to come back down and it kind of falls behind the valve flaps it forces the flap shut so again here you can see the valves shut and the blood can't come back through this shows this ongoing mechanism of shunting blood upwards the valves are open and then they snap shut the valves open and then they snap shut Fourthly, then, we have venomotor tone. Now, vena refers to our veins, and tone refers to a stimulation of the, the muscular wall that we have in veins. So you can see here, smooth muscle is in the blood vessel walls. In arteries, this, this is a much thicker layer, but there is a layer in veins. And our autonomic nervous system um, stimulates the contraction of this smooth muscle which kind of squeezes a little bit the lumen the gap in the middle and that squeeze that pressure helps return blood to the heart finally then gravity can be helpful in in returning blood to the heart but be careful it is only when blood is above the heart that gravity can help it come downward into the heart any blood in vessels below the heart gravity won't help you. Gravity is a problem for the blood below our heart level. So above the heart is good and is aided by gravity. Below the heart is a problem for us and we rely on all those other four mechanisms to return blood in that way. And you can see from this diagram actually if people feel lightheaded we lay them down, we take pressure off the circulatory system and it's much easier when you're flat for blood to move back to the heart. There's a less of a gravitational factor. So we need to talk about venous pooling. Now this is what happens um, in some situations. Certainly if you're on planes you can get swollen ankles and if you don't do a cool down properly after your uh, you know an intense workout or training session you can also suffer with venous pooling. So what is it? It's basically when blood pools or gathers um, in the veins in your body. So if I'd just done a cross-country run and I got to the end and I'm exhausted and all I want to do is stand there and not do anything, not do a cool down, my heart rate is still very high. I'm still generating quite a high cardiac output. So I'm still trying to send blood around my body. If the blood isn't returning to my heart, isn't helped along up against gravity to return, it will stay pooled in the veins. And this isn't good in, for a number of reasons. So we need to push the blood back up against gravity to get it back to the heart. If it doesn't occur, venous pooling happens. Um, this is particularly why and the image here, how can we prevent it or how can we avoid venous pooling? We make sure we do an active cool down because if you are cooling down, jogging, walking, in this case cycling, you are still using your muscles rhythmically and they therefore are contracting and relaxing and contracting and relaxing. And we know that that contraction and relaxation is important for our skeletal muscle pump to be working. So in order to avoid venous pooling, we need to make sure that we do an active cool down and we make that muscle pump work. The other thing that's become more common when people do a lot of training and certainly over a long period of time is to wear compression socks and that almost acts as an external squeeze to help push blood upward back to the heart against gravity. If you do a lot of, or in life actually, often it's work that can cause this, um, where you stand a lot, so actually teachers are a little bit vulnerable to these, and you're stood still, perhaps in a classroom or in any other job, your blood is weighted down with gravity a lot. You're not necessarily moving to make the skeletal muscle pump push the blood upwards, and you can suffer from varicose veins, which I believe can be very painful and not necessarily pretty to look at. So if you don't generate muscular contraction, your muscle pump won't work, your blood will pull and you'll put a lot of strain on those valves because the blood is always, always weighted down on them, you basically damage them and that's what a uh, varicose vein is. Um, so 
I just want to mention fainting actually because if again we don't have good venous return and blood pools and isn't going back to our heart it can't be pumped out as much often we can feel lightheaded the um, typically the soldier on parade who stood still for hours they have no skeletal muscle pump working all the blood pools in their boots they have less blood circulating being pumped out and often they can feel very very dizzy and can faint and they, they fall flat um, this could occur to you at the end of an intense event if you don't cool down same sort of principle so it's caused by after you've done heavy exercise literally just stopping not doing a cool down your muscle pump not working and therefore venous return being very poor and therefore less blood is ejected so lower stroke, stroke volume and cardiac output your blood pressure will drop you get less blood going to your or oxygen going to your brain and consequently you feel dizzy and you may know that to try to deal with this the pictures here show you, you try to get your um, head lower so you might raise somebody's feet and help the gravity uh, get the blood back to the heart and to the head or in this situation drop your head below your heart so again your your brain is getting oxygen so head below heart to aid blood flow there lie down to to just uh, restore blood pressure and ideally do an active cool down so moving on to starling's law of the heart the other factor that can uh, influence maintaining stroke volume and cardiac output we've kind of mentioned this in a previous video if your heart has a small volume that fills it so you have a low EDV um, the heart myocardium isn't particularly stretched you'll only have a small contraction and there'll be a low stroke volume now if you can stretch your myocardium so you have a lot of very good because you've got good venous return getting blood back to the heart it will fill more during the relaxation phase and that stretches the myocardium the heart chambers the walls and because they've been stretched their response is to contract much much more powerfully and ultimately then that will bring about a larger blood ejection during that contraction phase a larger stroke larger stroke volume so the amount your heart fills is reliant on venous return getting blood into the heart and if that is good then potentially you'll have a larger contraction and a larger stroke volume so greater filling because of venous return a lot of blood returning to the heart your EDV is higher so if your EDV is large you've got a lot of blood filling the chambers the cardiac fibers of the myocardium the chamber walls are stretched this is good because the greater the cardiac fiber stretch the more powerfully the cardiac fibers will respond they will contract with greater gusto um, incidentally the stretch also stimulates your SA node to fire faster so heart rate goes up but the greater the fiber stretch the greater that your cardiac fibers will contract and your stroke volume and your ejection fraction will be increased and actually incidentally if you have a lower heart rate whether it's resting or working what this means is you have a larger gap between the contractions where diastole occurs the filling occurs and if you've got more time to fill then potentially you'll get a larger EDV and the consequences is you might end up with a larger stroke volume so that's good a lower resting or working heart rate are a good thing and I've put the balloon image here because basically your heart chambers work in the same way as a balloon if you inflate the balloon with a little bit of air and then let go it it will basically contract and 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 shoot off with a little bit of force if you inflate the balloon with lots of air and let go the the fibers of the balloon have been stretched and they want to recoil and explode so they will shoot off with with much more force and that's the same principle behind um, stretching the cardiac fibers in your heart wall so to sum up then if we can increase or maximize venous return get a lot of blood returning back to our heart we can increase EDV it can fill with lots of blood and because of that filling we stretch our cardiac fibers and Starling's law of the heart is in place and we have a much more powerful stroke uh, contraction phase we can basically increase or maximize or even or maintain stroke volume and cardiac output so they all fit in and rely on each other